Hello and welcome to our time together here at Christchurch Walkley. It's lovely to have you with us wherever you're from. My name's Kenny and I'll be leading us through our time together. I don't know about you but as these weeks kind of roll on in lockdown I go through cycles of how I'm feeling about it. This week it's been a bit of kind of fatigue I suppose of it just going on for so long. I've kind of settled into a bit of a rhythm um, but almost slightly exhausted with it all. I know for others this week has been the struggle of illness and symptoms and sickness and the isolation that that brings for the rest of the family. For some of you it's pretty normal. Work's kind of carried on, it's been a bit odd, a bit different, um, but much is going on in a similar vein to the way it usually does. And I know for others this has actually been a chance to slow down a little bit. And this week has been a week you've quite enjoyed in the sunshine with your family, the foot off the gas I suppose, a little bit of life. But whatever your weeks have been like, when we come together, when we come before God, as it were, he doesn't ask us to kind of park those things and leave them outside as if they're not important, but just come and forget about them. But actually God wants us to bring the reality of life, the things we're struggling with, the things we're celebrating, the things that are difficult, the things that are joyful. He wants us to bring them all into his, into his presence, bring them with us as we come to him. And I suppose as we start our verse that we're going to read together from the book of Isaiah encourages us to do that. It encourages us to seek the Lord. So join with me in the verse that should be on the screen as we remind each other what it is that we gather together each week to do. So seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. That's a verse from Isaiah 55. Um, and Isaiah goes on in the next verse and he says this. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord that he may have compassion on him. And to our God for he will abundantly pardon. God wants us to seek him out, to call upon him, not just in the middle of life's struggles, but also when we look at our own lives and realise that we've not lived the way we should, we've not thought the way we should, we've not desired the things that we should. And God wants us to come before him knowing that he is a God who loves to pardon, who loves to forgive, who has compassion. So we're going to do that now. We're going to pray together to God. We're going to seek him out. Knowing that he's a compassionate God who we don't have to pretend that everything is right before. The words will be on your screen. Join with me as we pray. Most merciful Father, our creator and judge, we acknowledge and confess that we have sinned against you in thought word and deed. We have not loved you with all our heart and we have not loved our neighbours as ourselves. We earnestly repent and are truly sorry for all our sins. For your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ's sake, forgive us and strengthen us to serve and obey you in lives wholly renewed by your Spirit, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And it's a joy that God is compassionate, that he will abundantly pardon. That is the God we pray to. And if we have prayed, if we have repented, if we have sought him out, then we know that in Jesus Christ he forgives us for all the things we do wrong and all the things that we desire that we shouldn't. And we're going to hear from God in his word now as Elisa comes to read to us. The reading is in the book of Ephesians from chapter 1 starting at verse 1. The reading is Ephesians chapter 1, verses 1 to 10. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the will of God, to the saints who are in Ephesus and are faithful in Christ Jesus, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed 
be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. In love he predestined us for adoption as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace, with which he has blessed us in the beloved. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of his will, according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ, as a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let me pray. Living God, help us so to hear your holy word that we may truly understand, that understanding we may believe and believing we may follow in all faithfulness and obedience, seeking your honour and glory in all that we do through Christ our Lord. Amen. We love a good redemption story. The villain who turns good at the last minute the hero who wins against all the odds. Think Andy Dufresne in Shawshank or Sidney Carton in A Tale of Two Cities, Darth Vader even in Star Wars. And it's not just fiction, but real life redemption stories too. It's why the reality TV contests emphasise that the sad backstory of some of the contestants. The world of sport too is particularly fond of a redemption story. Think Tiger Woods, Tyson Fury, Ben Stokes, but in almost all the examples, real or fictional, the redemption is something that the person finds, achieves or even earns for themselves. The great story of history is a redemption story. We arrive today at verse 7 in Paul's high definition panoramic portrait of the plans and purposes of God. It's the point at which Paul shows us the whole thing is a redemption story. Only in this one, you and I are not the heroes. In this one, redemption is not something that we have to find or achieve or earn ourselves. It is a gift. It is something that we have. Verse 7. In him we have redemption. If we have Christ then we have redemption. Redemption, that the word itself is about being set free through a payment being made. A slave could be redeemed, bought back by an old master or freed to rejoin their family if a payment was made and their debts were cleared. Land or property likewise could be redeemed. You bought it back, you paid the price to release it from its mortgage. In the Old Testament, for some crimes, even death row criminals could be redeemed by a payment, a, a ransom for their lives. Perhaps most important of all, the people of Israel, God's people, their founding story as a nation was a redemption story. God redeemed them from being Pharaoh's slaves in Egypt in order to bring them to be his own sons. Uh, Paul is saying something very much the same as happened to Christians. We, we saw it last week, verse 5. God predestined us for adoption through Christ. Well, this is how that adoption plan was actually put into effect. How, how the plan that was hatched in God's mind and heart, Father, Son and Holy Spirit, before all time began, how that plan has been rolled out in history itself. This is how God's electing and predestining love has taken hold of you and I and brought us into his family as heirs in his kingdom. God's plan and our adoption story, it's a redemption story. 
So yes, it's a bit of a reality check. Sure, God chose us. He chose us, verse 4, to be holy and blameless. That's not because we were already naturally or inherently holy or blameless. We need redemption. Yes, God predestined us for adoption, but that's not because we were the most promising candidates. We need redemption. God took us from the slave market or the prison to be his heirs. So, yes, it's a bit of a shock because we tend to think we're, we're all right. We're not perfect, we know for sure, but we think we're a decent addition to God's team. We're basically good, but we need redemption. Even if we don't think we're basically good, we certainly think we're free. But we need redemption. We need setting free. We're in chains. We're in debt. We're on death row. This is God's message in the scriptures from cover to cover. The human problem is bigger than unfulfilled potential. The big issue for humanity is not simply that we need a, a better education, a, a little bit of therapy, a, a better diet. If we are to be God's sons and heirs, we need deliverance. We need releasing from our bonds. We need redemption. How humbling and how glorious because we have redemption. If we have Christ, then we have redemption. But redemption from what exactly? Redemption is a big word in the scriptures, like a great big treasure chest crammed full. At points it describes the whole of God's rescue of us. Every way that he sets us free from everything that we need setting free from. So variously in scripture, we are redeemed from an empty way of life, from the curse that God's law puts us under. We will be redeemed, we're told, when our bodies are resurrected, and then we'll be set free, released even from the chains of death itself. But here Paul's focus is a little bit more narrow. There's a, a part of redemption that he wants us to see in particular. And in some ways, it's the key that unlocks the whole treasure chest of redemption. In him, he says, we have redemption, the forgiveness of our trespasses. When someone trespasses, they cross a line they shouldn't cross. But but don't think of a, a harmless ramble as accidentally wandering through a farmer's field. Think of a burglar. Think breaking and entering. Think you've got no right to do that, to take that, to go there. We trespass when we cross boundaries of behaviour and thinking, of desire and action that God says we must not cross. Our trespasses are violations, acts of rebellion. And it is from our trespasses that we need to be released. They are the, the debt that has us locked down, sold into slavery, waiting on death row. You see, there's a payment, a punishment due to our trespasses that God's justice demands. We love a good redemption story. Until we don't, that is. Uh, one of the reasons we can tolerate it in fiction, when the villain turns good at the last, uh, it's that we don't have to forgive them or live with them afterward ourselves. Darth Vader doesn't come and join the Rebel Alliance. And how would it work if he did, as if that one act of good can somehow make up for decades of evil? We know in real life that redemption is not so cheap. Forgiveness is a big deal because trespasses are a big deal. Maybe you've done things that you think can't be forgiven. Maybe you're withholding forgiveness yourself from someone else because you know how much their actions have hurt you. You know what a big deal forgiveness is. We love a good redemption story. That is until we don't. Ben Stokes's cricketing triumph, re redemption after his drunken ball and his uh, brawl and his brush with the law, or Tyson Fury fighting back from struggles with addiction and depression. 
Well, that sort of redemption is one thing. But when Harvey Weinstein declares himself an addict and books himself into a clinic for some therapy, we don't feel it's enough. When Jeffrey Epstein dies in his cell, we feel cheated. We, we want there to be a day in court still for the victims, for justice. We feel that some trespasses at least must be exposed for what they really are, condemned the way they deserve and justly punished. The thought that God's justice demands a penalty for our trespasses, that might make us feel uncomfortable. I don't like to think of God that way, we might say. But that's really because they're our trespasses. If we're honest, the idea that God would brush human violations under his under the carpet or, or, or wink at them or laugh them off like they're just boisterous behaviour and he's a sentimental grandparent. Well, that that is far, far worse. Forgiveness is a big deal. Trespasses are a big deal. That's why we're told in him we have redemption through his blood. God's forgiveness does not wink at our trespasses. God's forgiveness comes in such a way that our trespasses are still exposed for what they really are, condemned the way they deserve and justly punished. Only all of that took place through the sacrificial death of Christ. God didn't shrug our debt off. He paid it himself through Christ, his son. Through his blood means a sacrificial death, a life given in sacrifice as the lifeblood is poured out. Death is the penalty God's justice demands, but Christ was the one who bore it. Christ, of course, was not personally guilty for any of our trespasses, but he took responsibility for them. Now, normally you can't take responsibility for someone else's crime or debt like that. If I break a red light, the camera flashes, but on the form we put down that you were driving the car. Well, that's fraud. But we do have it in law in some cases that liability, responsibility can be transferred within a certain kind of relationship. When you get married, if your spouse has debts, you can become liable for those debts. To have Jesus take responsibility for our debts, we too must be properly related to him. We need to be united to him. That's why redemption is in him. United to him like a, a wife is united to her husband in marriage or like a, a, a body is united to its head. For those who are in that way joined to Christ, he has taken responsibility. He has taken on liability for our debts. He paid the penalty for them through his blood. So if we have Christ, then we have redemption through his blood. So we must not think of our redemption or our forgiveness even as something cheap. But so too we must not think that we have to still pay. As if we can put down some, some payment through some good that we could do or some way that we can change that will we'll make up for all of our trespasses. When you meet up with someone for a drink or for lunch and, and at the end there, there's that little tussle over who is going to pay. And for a moment you're at an impasse, locked in by, by Britishness into a mutually cancelling politeness. Well, just occasionally when I've gone out to meet someone, I might forget my wallet or I've got no cash on me. At that point, there's no debate. There's no option. You just have to accept gratefully. Someone else will pay. Good deeds, a, a changed lifestyle, devoting our money or, or even our whole lives in sacrifice for others. Those things are part of the Christian life, but they are not valid currency when it comes to our redemption. 
We can search our pockets all we like, but we've got nothing. Jesus has paid. Only Jesus could pay. Now, we might find that awkward, beyond awkward humbling, but we must not try to pay our own way. That would be to refuse the, the only redemption that we can have for an imaginary redemption that we could never earn ourselves. The only thing to do is to accept gratefully. Someone else paid. Jesus has paid. As we said at the beginning, we are not the heroes in these redemption stories of ours. As if to put the final nail in that coffin, Paul adds that all of this is according to the riches of his grace. <coughs> Locked in guilt and slavery on death row, we had neither the resources nor the will to redeem ourselves. But God does. He has the will. He has the resources. His grace here is described as if it is wealth. God's favour, his undeserved kindness. He has it in plentiful supply. His grace is abundant. God is not going to run out of grace. And he's not dishing it out with a teaspoon either. Verse 8 says, his grace which he lavished upon us. God hasn't redeemed us begrudgingly or stingily or miserly or meagerly there's something almost opulent something extravagant in his grace poured out on us so that we're, we're drenched it's more than we could ever deserve and it's more than we could ever need our redemption is totally undeserved and totally provided for we have redemption it's our present possession if we have Christ, we have redemption by God's abundant grace. So the question is, do you have Christ? If the answer is honestly, no. Why not put your trust in him today? That's how we take hold of him. That's not reforming ourselves or improving ourselves or cleaning ourselves up first. Faith in Christ, that's not code for finding or achieving or earning redemption ourselves. Now it's coming empty handed, knowing that we've got nothing with which to pay our great debt. Coming to him, receiving him as your Lord, as the one who will take responsibility for your debts and for all of your life from this point forward. And if we thus receive him, then we receive the redemption he paid for. If we have Christ, we have redemption. Do you have Christ? Well, if the answer is yes, then know that in him you have redemption. That's our story now. You, you and I, we were sold into a slavery of our own choosing. We were chained up awaiting a sentence we deserved and God came into the slave market. God came down to the prison looking for his children and heirs. In Christ, he redeemed us, paid for by his blood. He released us and he took us to be the heirs in his kingdom. Wonderfully, thankfully, we're not the heroes, but our lives are a redemption story. Well, let's turn to God in grateful prayer before we turn to him in song. As we prayed at the beginning, so we pray again. Living God, help us so to hear your holy word that we may truly understand, that understanding we may believe and believing we may follow in all faithfulness and obedience, seeking your honour and glory in all that we do through Christ our Lord. Amen.
In Christ alone my hope is found He is my life, my strength, my song This cornerstone, this solid ground Firm through the fiercest drought and storm What heights of love, what depths of peace When fears are still, when striving cease My comforter, my all in all Here in the love of Christ I'll stand In Christ alone of flesh, fullness of God in helpless pain, this gift of love and righteousness, scorned by the ones He came to save, till on that cross as Jesus died, the wrath of God was satisfied. was laid, here in the death of Christ I live. There in the ground, in the ground. Body lay, light of the world by darkness slain, then bursting forth in glorious day, up from the grave he rose again, and as he stands in victory, since curse has lost its grip on me, as he stands, as he stands. Since curse has lost its grip on me For I am His and He is mine Bought with the precious blood of Christ Guilt in life, no fear in death. This is the power of Christ in me. From life's first cry to final breath, Jesus commands my destiny. No power of hell, no scheme of man can ever work me from his hand of heart. Power of hell, no scheme of man can never pluck me from his hand till he returns or calls me home. Here in the power of Christ I'll stand.
true of us and our lives not just on a Sunday afternoon when we kind of gather together as much as this is gathering together to praise the Lord but true of us too on a Monday morning in the things we think about and the things we say in what we do don't want all our actions to praise God to bring him glory and of course we know that's only going to happen if we're changed from the inside out if we start to desire God if our hearts and our minds are fixed on him and the things that he's given to us, his blessings. So we're going to turn to God now in prayer and we're going to pray that God would work in us, that he would change us and that he would help us to fix our eyes on him. Let me lead us firstly in a prayer and then we'll join together to pray as one. Almighty God, you alone can put right our sinful intentions and desires. Make it so we love what you command and desire what you promise. So that amongst all the changes that are going on in our world at the moment, all the things that are uncertain, make it so that our hearts will still be firmly fixed on you. The only place where we can find true joy. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, we pray. Amen. We're going to pray now together in the words of the Lord's Prayer. Um, if your children have scattered, I know that not many months ago, at least the sparklers learned the Lord's Prayer. Um, so perhaps gather in the background with you. Let's pray together. Let's pray in the words that Jesus taught his disciples when they asked, how can I pray? And they didn't know. So the words will be on your screen. Let's pray together. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. We're coming to the end of our time together. Thank you for joining us. Do join us again next week if you'd like to at four o'clock on Sunday afternoon. Details will be 
on the website again of how you can find the link. If you want to know more about things we've talked about, find out more about us as a church, then do get in touch. There is a contact form on the website or you can email us at info at christchurchwalkley.co.uk. I'm going to finish now with some, some words of blessing from the Bible for God's people. And if you are still with us on the Zoom meeting, then do stick around and we'll get into smaller groups just to chat and spend some time with one another. But let me finish with some words from the Bible. May the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his face upon you and give you peace. Amen.